Mushroom Cultivation Manual for the Small Mushroom Entrepreneur. I discovered the world of mushrooms in 1994 during a meeting organized in Beijing by the Royal Academy of Sciences of Sweden and the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Professor Dr. Carl Gorand Hedden, former director of the biology department of Karolinska Institute, and Professor Dr. Li Wenhua, dean of the School of Environment of the Renmin University, had invited a select group to discuss new ways of responding to the urgency to respond to the basic needs for people in terms of water, food, health housing, energy and jobs. As the head of a think tank that was charged with formulating new ideas for business at the United Nations University in preparation of the Kyoto Protocol that was to become a reality three years later I was a student in this room filled with scientists. Whereas all presentations inspired me, there was one that surprised me, Professor Dr. Xu Ting Chang, the dean of the Faculty of Biological Sciences of the Chinese University of Hong Kong introduced the audience to his latest findings. In mycology. The simple and clear message made a lasting impression. First, the fact that bio waste rich in fibers should never be left to rot or landfill, that it should turn into a substrate for mushroom farming. Instead of rotting debris that generates methane gas, mushrooms would produce food only emitting carbon dioxide. That was a breakthrough in the run up for the global agreement on climate change. Second, Mushrooms supply a wealth and breadth of essential amino acids in such abundance that if compared dry base with meat, it could compete. This offered an insight that was very new to me, since I was hardly acquainted with the white button mushroom and never considered it nutritious. The talk of the day was not about this agaricus bisporus, rather of the wealth and diversity of Chinese mushrooms, which have been farmed over centuries, including the shiitake. Professor Shooting Cheng made us realize that any country with a food processing industry could build up a mushroom business. I immediately invited him to join us for meetings in Windhoek at the University of Namibia, in Zimbabwe at Africa University, and in Colombia at the Federation of Coffee Farmers. His message was loud and clear, the straw of wheat, the water hyacinth, from the lakes and the waste of coffee all served as a substrate for mushrooms. When St. as friends call this guru of mycology, sat down with Dr. Jorge Cardenas, the president of the cooperative that united 650,000 coffee farming families, he strongly advised the leadership that the future of coffee is not in producing more coffee. Rather the future of coffee is in the transformation of all the coffee waste into mushroom substrates. Senecafe, the research center of the Coffee Federation, embarked on a seven-year program and studied every component from the stalks from the bush that need pruning, the pulp that is fermenting off. The beans, the silver film of the roasted coffee, and the grounds after brewing was mapped for its use. It was like finding bonanza in a world that was passing through a harsh crisis. Since only 0.2% of the coffee harvest is actually ingested, the opportunities are vast. The key is how to harness this opportunity, either on the farm or at the point of consumption. Fortunately, a network of entrepreneurs emerged around these opportunities. These entrepreneurs were not located in the Capital cities and were flush of cash, these were community leaders operating in the periphery of society like Carmenza Jaramillo in the peri-urban zones of Manizales, the coffee capital of Colombia, and Margaret Taguera, the laboratory technician in charge of tissue culture who worked with orphan girls in Zimbabwe. Both realized that mushrooms on coffee is not just a biological process, it is an opportunity for a social transformation. Hundreds of entrepreneurs took notice and started small-scale businesses. In the region of El Wila, 90 production centers were started in less than a few years, and in Zimbabwe, hundreds of orphans found a new opportunity in life as the mushrooms provided them food security, which gave them the self-confidence to fight against abuse. When Chido Guevara, one of the first orphan girls to get trained at the age of 11 in the farming of mushrooms on grass clippings, corn cobs and water hyacinth, something that is within reach of everyone, committed to bring this technique to everyone. She traveled throughout the country, and later throughout Africa and beyond, and when she explained at Chipinga, Zimbabwe, to women working the coffee farm for less than $2 per day, that on the waste from the farm it is possible to get food for their children within a few weeks' time, then these women would get up, sing, dance, and do it. The farming of mushrooms once demonstrated that it works, through the cooking of a local dish, enriched 
with freshly harvested fruiting bodies, is followed up by action. There is no need to write a strategic paper, a business plan, a strengths and weaknesses opportunities and threats analysis, a pilot project, or a technology audit. Farming mushrooms starts with an awareness that you have all what is needed available, and that if you put your mind to it and follow a few basic hygiene rules, then you will be able to harvest, perhaps even for the rest of your life. Twenty years later, there are an estimated 5,000 mushroom on coffee farms. While a few have attempted to go for large-scale production, like Cetas de Colombia in Medellin, and one exploited the experiences to create a failed network of franchise mushroom farms, the initiatives have been growing rapidly around the world from farms in Harare to urban initiatives in San Francisco and innovation. Hubs in Rotterdam where young entrepreneurs void of any exposure to mushroom farming in the center of the city now have trained 30 others to start their business. Professor Chang was keen on insisting that the farming of mushrooms was half science and half art, and indeed when Cheeto Guevara farms mushrooms it seems so easy, whereas others have to struggle to get going, but once they master the art, it is a great satisfaction to witness the spreading of something that seems that simple and yet has many hurdles to overcome. The main obstacle is the clarity that farming mushrooms is not just a potential business, it is also an opportunity to transform society beyond climate change benefits. Mushrooms empower people and provide access to healthy food, generating jobs, while transforming available resources, unfortunately considered by many as waste, cascading food and nutrition, addressing fundamental social and ecological issues. While the creation of 5,000 farming operations is by many considered a remarkable result, it is by no means a success. The Ziri Network, this web of thousands of scientists and practitioners from around the world is convinced that the annual production of 10 million tons of coffee waste that continues to be discarded at farms, industries and cafes or restaurants provides enough material for at least 1 million initiatives. And if we consider coffee, why not consider tea, corn cobs, sawdust and rice straw all varieties of biomass that represent an ideal substrate for mushrooms to grow? We quickly see the creation of another 100 million tons of amino acids and the production of perhaps as much as 50 million tons of feed. These are major shifts in our capacity to produce food and respond to immediate needs alleviating hunger where it is needed most. Every refugee in any camp could learn how to farm mushrooms. And yet, we prefer to supply processed food and aluminium packs. Mushrooms are not just healthy food, mushrooms hold the potential of transforming our modern day society into an entrepreneurial world, where we succeed in building up a more resilient community first. And foremost, because we transform biomass into food, and the waste of this food is most of the time. A great feed for animals, cascading nutrition, matter and energy. It allows our economies to grow without expecting our earth to produce more, we learn with the mushrooms how to do more with what the earth already produces. This is a gift we received from our Chinese mentor, and a practice we learned from our African, Latin American and European mycologists who worked tirelessly in propagating this. Know how open source, sharing what we learn, and learning from each other in order to offer society a chance to stamp out hunger, generate more jobs and empower young people to have a purpose in life. Mushrooms, conventional food, and alternative medicine. Most edible mushrooms have a number of properties in common. The most obvious is their high water content, which varies from 85 to 95 percent of their fresh weight and makes mushrooms vulnerable for bruising and loss of storage quality. After harvest, mushrooms must be kept cool to prevent water loss and discoloration. When this is not done properly or when mushrooms are affected by bacteria or parasitic fungi, most mushrooms will have only a very short shelf life, lose their food quality and cannot be sold. The dry matter of mushrooms consists mainly of fibrous carbohydrates and further of proteins. Unsaturated, fats and a very high number of very diverse compounds, antioxidative polyphenols, vitamins, and inorganic elements as phosphorus, P, potassium, K, and magnesium, Mg, the diverse. Compounds are present at low concentrations, but their biological effects may be impressive. Table 1 Shows the composition of dry matter of the white button mushroom Agaricus bisporus, from Stoikovic. Et al. 2014, also known colloquially as the champignon. Table 1. Main composition of cultivated Agaricus bisporus and Agaricus brasiliensis equals Agaricus. Blazii, expressed in grams per 100 grams dry weight. 
In addition to the major components shown in Table 1, mushrooms contain bactericidal and fungicidal components that form a natural protection against offensive microbials and could also be applied. As protective agents in biological foods such as yogurt, Stoikovic et al. 2014. The question arises whether mushrooms are a healthy food. SHI take, Lentinula edota, is reported to have AP 14% of its dry weight as protein, Sistani et al. 2007, which makes it comparable. To some vegetables, wheat and rice, Chang and Buswell, 1996, but it is less than that of animal meat. Further, the protein seems high in glutamic acid and aspartic acid, but is low in methionine and cysteine. The answer to the question is that for vegetarians mushrooms are not a very healthy food. Assuming a MDI, minimum daily intake, of 60 grams protein per day, it can be easily calculated that even a daily consumption of 1 kilogram of fresh mushrooms would not suffice. The advice is then to use a variety of lean meat and various vegetables and or mushrooms to supply the required protein. Agaricus bisporus is a valuable source of magnesium, phosphorus and vitamin D, vitamin D is readily available from Agaricus bisporus and Pleurotus sp after exposure to sunlight or other sources of UVB light, the fungal wall component or gosterol, being converted to vitamin D2. Post-harvest drying of these mushrooms in sunlight induces high amounts of vitamin D. Different animal studies have shown that light-induced edible mushrooms are safe and that vitamin D2 is indeed available. Calvo, et al. 2013. In a human experiment with 26 patients that were deficient in vitamin D2, Urbane et al., 2011, have described that UV-irradiated agaricus bisporus could improve their vitamin D2 status. The same way as synthetic vitamin D2. The energy content of mushrooms is low which makes them suited for a low-calorie diet that is much desired in the affluent Western world. Mushrooms can be considered a high dietary fiber food, which relates to its non-digestible carbohydrates, mainly chitin. Agaricus bisporus contains 41% of its carbohydrates as dietary fiber and Pleurotus sager kaju 44%, Goyle et al. 2015. This high content of dietary fiber makes mushrooms suitable as an anti-constipation food or to be used in a diet designed to prevent this modern times hindrance of human well-being. In patients with functional constipation, fiber supplements derived from auricularia. Here, mushrooms significantly improved constipation-related symptoms without serious side effects. Kim et al., 2004. Apart from the vitamin D2 precursor ergosterol, agaricus bisporus contains significant amounts of the vitamins B2 equals riboflavin, 24% of recommended daily intake per 100 gram fresh, vitamin B3 equals niacin, 18%, and vitamin B5 equals panthetenic acid, 15%. 9% of the recommended daily intake of potassium K and 9% of phosphorus can be supplied by the same 100 grams of fresh product, from USDA State Route 21. Database. The polyunsaturated fatty acids, PUFA, present in mushrooms are often mentioned as contributing to good health. Up to 80% of the edible mushroom's fatty acids are of a polyunsaturated nature, Rees et. L. 2012, but the amount per serving of 100 grams fresh mushrooms is maximum 0.15 grams of PUFA. It seems not very likely that this small amount can play an important dietary role. Mushrooms as an alternative medicine. Medicinal mushrooms are mushrooms or extracts from mushrooms that are thought to give treatment for various diseases, yet these effects remain unconfirmed in mainstream science and allopathic medicine. In the Western world, i.e. the USA and the EU, they are not approved as medicines for therapy or prevention. Such use of mushrooms therefore falls into the domain traditional Chinese medicine, TCM or complementary medicine. In spite of the remark above, mushrooms have been employed in Chinese and Japanese medicine. For hundreds of years. Ganoderma lucidum, also known as Raishur or Ling Ji, was used as a remedy against various cancers for over 500 years, and Lentinula edota, SHI take, was found to enhance vital energy and cure colds since the Ming dynasty, Mizuno, 1995. It is only since the 1960s that medicinal mushrooms were introduced in Europe and the USA as possible cure for many diseases, and that has started a search for the validity of the statements about medicinal successes that is still continuing. Mushroom compounds that are causative in, presumed, medicinal effects are high molecular weight. Polysaccharides, and a variety of smaller compounds as polyphenols and triterpenes, and many molecules that have possible signaling functions but have not yet been defined. The effects of mushrooms and mushroom components on human and animal health have been studied in vitro, as well as in vivo. 
tens of thousands of scientific articles have been published over the past 50 years, but up till now no definite conclusions could be drawn whether mushrooms and their components can cure severe disease in humans. The compounds. Polysaccharides are building components of the fungal cell wall, they consist of a long chain of the sugars glucose, mannose and galactose connected by 1, 3, 1, 4 and 1, 6 bonds. Depending on their conformation they are called alpha, alpha, or SS. Beta, chains. They can be either water-soluble or non-soluble. Figure 2. Schematic drawing of the structure of a 1, 3, 1, 6 SS glucan. Best known examples of mushroom. Beta glucans are lentinin and schizophilin from Lentinula edota and schizophilum commune, respectively. Some active beta glucans are bound to peptides, examples are polysaccharide K and polysaccharide peptide from Tramites versicolor. The molecular weights of these materials vary from 10.000 d to 1.5 by 106 d. Polyphenolic compounds consist of large multiples of organic rings carrying one or more OH groups. They have many functions in nature. They can determine color and taste and are also involved in the oxidative status of organisms as they can give off oxygen or bind oxygen depending on pH and oxygen. Supply. The polyphenols are the main antion prooxidants present in mushrooms. They can also specifically combine with cell membrane or nuclear receptors and be responsible for intracellular signaling effects. Figure 3. Schematic drawing of T. Polyphenols. Comparable compounds are present in mushrooms. Triterpenes or triterpenoids are carbohydrates, consisting of one or more pentacyclic, five-ring, structure. In animals and fungi their biosynthesis is through linosterol, they form a structural part of the cell membrane and they could be involved in signaling by binding to cell membrane receptors. Although many have been extracted from medicinal mushrooms, the functions of most are not known. Well, known examples of triterpenoids are the ganoderic acids from Ganoderma lucidum. Effects of mushroom compounds. Effects of polysaccharides. The biological effect of mushroom polysaccharides is attributed to their recognition by immune cells, leukocytes, and membrane receptors as dectin-1, the toll-like, TLR, receptors and or the complement. Receptor, CR3. Binding affects the proliferation and differentiation of the cells and determines thereby their function in immunity. 1, 3, 1, 6, beta glucans are the major immunomodulatory polysaccharides, they determine the activity and the direction of the immune system. Mushroom polysaccharides can activate innate immunity and cause the secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha, IFN gamma, interferon gamma, L1 beta, interleukin minus 1 beta, from immune cells like macrophages, natural killer cells, NK cells, and T-lymphocytes. Dendritic cells, DC, are the phagocytic cells of the innate immune system, and they present the antigens they absorb to the start point of the adaptive immunity. The T-helper cell. When gastric or colorectal cancer patients were supplemented with PSK one month. After surgical resection, PSK was reported to shift the T-helper cell's balance, Th1 slash Th2, toward Th1. Dominance resulting in increased cytotoxicity for cancer cells. When Th1 is high, the immunity is shifted. To inflammatory effects, when Th2 is high, the effect is immunosuppressive. Inflammation forms a defensive barrier against infectious disease and growth of abnormal cells such as cancer. Anti-inflammatory, immunosuppression, activity could prevent and possibly soften the overactive immunity in various autoimmune diseases and allergies. Bactericidal and fungicidal effects. Mushrooms can be easily colonized by bacteria and fungi. During evolution, they have adapted to these threats by developing defense mechanisms. Many mushrooms extracts show antimicrobial properties. Agaricus blasii extracts showed mics and MBCs that were equal to or better for inactivation of P. aeruginosa than those of ampicillin and streptomycin, Stoikovic et al. 2014. Anti quorum sensing. Many pathogens use the formation of biofilms as a defense against their host's immune system and against antibiotic treatment. Biofilms are vast bacterial populations in a host that are protected by a layer of polymeric substances. Biofilms use quorum sensing for their protection, a bacterial coordination system that allows density-dependent cell, cell communication, 
considering the rapid spread of multidrug resistance, the development of new antimicrobial or antivirulence agents that act upon newly adapted microbial targets has become a very pressing priority. Agaricus blazii and also Anonidus. Obliquus chaga were found to have anti-quorum sensing compounds next to more common antimicrobials, so Kovic et al. 2014. Application of these findings awaits techniques for large-scale production and purification of anti-quorum sensing compounds. Antioxidant effects. Oxidative stress caused by an imbalanced metabolism and an excess of reactive oxygen species. ROS lead to a range of health disorders in humans. Our endogenous antioxidant defense mechanisms and our dietary intake of antioxidants potentially regulate our oxidative homeostasis. Numerous. Synthetic antioxidants can effectively improve defense mechanisms, but because of their adverse toxic effects under certain conditions, preference is given to natural compounds, such as for mushrooms. Almost all mushrooms show considerable antioxidant activity. Edible mushrooms might be used directly in enhancement of antioxidant defenses through dietary supplementation to reduce the level of oxidative stress. Kozarski et al., 2015, have recently published an extended review of antioxidants of edible mushrooms. The diseases. Mushrooms and their components have been used during ages as a traditional medicine in the prevention and therapy of a variety of diseases. Cancer. Although hundreds of studies were published on the curative effects of mushrooms and their extracts on various cancers in experimental animals, no convincing information is available on the effects in humans that justifies a definite conclusion. Instead many studies are biased, too small, non-randomized, and non-conclusive. The Cochrane Institute is an objective observer of medical testing in humans. Their latest report is on the effects of Ganoderma lucidum medication in cancer patients, Gene et al. 2016, and stated. Our review did not find sufficient evidence to justify the use of G. lucidum as a first-line treatment for cancer. It remains uncertain whether G. lucidum helps prolong long-term cancer survival. However, G. lucidum could be administered as an alternative adjunct to conventional treatment in consideration of its potential of enhancing tumor response and stimulating host immunity. G. lucidum was generally well tolerated by most participants with only a scattered number of minor adverse events. No major toxicity was observed across the studies. For polysaccharide K, PSK, from Coriolis versicolor, the situation is not much different. PSK may improve the immune function, reduce tumor-associated symptoms, and extend survival in lung cancer. Patients PSK was reported to enhance dostaxel-induced prostate cancer tumor suppression, apoptosis and anti-tumor responses. Cochrane has started a new search to estimate the effects of PSK on cancer. Use of G. lucidum and of PSK in the fight against cancer are repeatedly mentioned to increase the quality of life of cancer patients. What the cause of this effect is still needs to be evaluated. In breast cancer patients' quality of life increased after supplementary SHI take extract treatment, the same as for aid blazii extract, on et al. 2004. These are only a few examples of many anti-cancer assays in humans. The results are hopeful, but nothing is definite yet. A possible interesting feature of Agaricus bisporus is its anti-aromatase activity that could be deployed in the prevention and treatment of breast cancer in postmenopausal women, but here again. This awaits further research. Work of Chan's group, group et al. 1999, in the City of Hope Institute has revealed promising results. In Japan, 30 years of experience with the aforementioned PSK as an adjuvant in cancer therapy led to two impressive meta-studies demonstrating that immunoactivation with PSK together with surgery and chemotherapy led to an average longer survival in 300 colorectal cancer patients as well as benefits to patients with gastrocarcinoma, Sakamoto et al. 2006, Oba et al. 2007. Although these are impressive results, the adjuvant effects of medicinal mushroom components in cancer therapy need to be further studied. Autoimmune diseases and allergies. Mushroom polysaccharides decrease the concentration of pro-inflammatory cytokines as TNFA and IFNG in lipopolysaccharide-stimulated cell systems in vitro. This proves that mushroom polysaccharides can be immunosuppressive under certain conditions. Although there are several case stories on curative effects of mushroom polysaccharides on human rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases, reliable and published evidence is very scarce. 
Some experiments in rats have shown that induced arthritis can be cured by application of felonous polysaccharides, Neo et al., 2015, but the overall information consists mostly of interesting theories, rumors, and non-published cases. Hetland et al., 2011, found anti-allergy effects of Agaricus blasii, i.e. andocentium, in mice, x. Plainable by changes in cytokines. Most of the interesting work of this group was however done on ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease in humans. They, Thurkelsen et al., 2016, have carried out a randomized single-blinded clinical study on the effects of andocentium on 50 patients with symptomatic ulcerative colitis of which 24 were treated for 21 days and 26 served as controls. Fatigue, quality of life. For bodily pain, vitality, social functioning and mental health improved in the andocent trademark group. There were no alterations in general blood samples and fecal calprotectin. This supports its use as a supplement to conventional medication for patients with mild to moderate symptoms from ulcerative colitis. The patients did not report any harms or unintended effects of Andosand trademark in this study. Neurodegenerative diseases. In the coming five decades, average human life expectancy will considerably grow, and as a result, an increase of age dependent decline in immunocompetence and an increase in systemic diseases and in neurodegenerative disease is to be expected. Cancer, atherosclerosis, diabetes and obesity have already increased and will continue to do so. Neurodegenerative diseases as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, dementia and stroke are mostly age-dependent. Mushrooms such as Entrodia camphorate, Ganoderma lucidum, Griffola frondosa, Herichia marinaceus, Felinus lentius and Pleurotus giganteus may improve memory and cognition. Functions the mushrooms, either extracts from basidiocarps slash mycelia or isolated compounds, reduced beta-amyloid-induced neurotoxicity and had anti-acetylcholinesterase, neurite outgrowth stimulation, nerve growth factor, NGF, synthesis, neuroprotective, antioxidant, and anti-neuro-inflammatory effects, Fon et al. 2015. Felonus lintius ethyl acetate extract containing mostly polyphenols was found. Neuroprotective in vitro, by reducing oxidative stress and preventing apoptosis, Choi et al., 2016. In mice with experimentally induced stroke, intraperitoneal treatment with antioxidative P, igniarius polyphenol extract at low concentration caused a reduction of the infarction volume by 62.2% compared to untreated mice, Swabjikian et al., 2015. No reliable data concerning the effects of mushrooms and their extracts on human neurodegenerative disease are available at present. The observation that higher dietary intake of vitamin D2 was associated with lower risk of developing AD among older women could possibly relate to a higher intake of ergosterol from sunlight-exposed dried mushrooms. Further information on the possible use of mushrooms against neurodegenerative disease can be found in the excellent review article of Fani T. L. 2015. Diabetes. Diabetes type 2 is a rising problem in the modern world. Lifestyle, diet and genetics are causal in the development of obesity and diabetes type 2. As many conventional drugs show adverse side effects, a search was done for potential effects of mushrooms in treatment and prevention of diabetes. So far there is only a single statistically reliable study published on the effects in humans. Sue et al., 2007 performed a clinical randomized double-blind placebo. Controlled trial with 72 Chinese subjects who had proven diabetes type 2 for over a year and who had been taking glycoside and methformin for over six months. They showed that treatment with 1.5 grams of agaricus blasii extract per day for 12 weeks improves. The insulin resistance of the patients from 6.6 .6 to 3.6 in the Homeostasis model assessment for insulin resistance. Blood pressure was lower and fasting triglycerides of the patients were much lower than the controls. Surprisingly, no further results have been published since. Summary. In the text above a personal vision is given on the role of mushrooms as food and as alternative. Medicine. Mushrooms are a conventional food of rather average quality. They can be part of a healthy diet when consumed with other sources of protein. Eaten in normal quantity, they do not supply sufficient protein for a vegetarian diet. 
On the other hand, they may form a delicacy of unheard quality due to their subtle taste. As an alternative medicine, they cannot replace allopathic medical treatments. In cancer, they may yet function as adjuvants. In other diseases, they could play a slightly more prominent role. In the future, this may change. It seems relatively sure that they can increase quality of life during conventional cancer treatment and may have a positive effect on so autoimmune diseases, e.g. Crohn's disease. Most mushrooms carry cell wall polysaccharides that cause immunomodulatory effects, it seems. Likely that the mechanism is the re-establishment of equilibrium, i.e. immune homeostasis. This could explain pro- and anti-inflammatory effects exerted by the same compounds in different patients with the same disease. The role of mushroom antioxidants is generally overvalued. Polyphenols can be pro- as well as antioxidant, depending on the redox situation in situ. The effects of prooxidatives and the reactive oxygen species they induce are insufficiently known in both cause and cure of disease. Receptor slash ligand. Interactions are still between mushroom compounds, e.g. fatty acids and triterpenoids and others. And animal cell membranes should be studied and may rapidly lead to more understanding of the role. Mushroom compounds may play in human and animal health. I have not tried to give a complete overview, I have scavenged fragments from Scopus. References in Description Mushroom Substrate Preparation The first, and probably most important, step in producing white button mushrooms, i.e. champignons, is proper substrate preparation, involving a two-phase composting process prior to spawning. Phase I consist of high-temperature composting, 80 degrees C, with the goal of creating a uniform, high-moisture substrate that is selective for the mushroom to grow and feed upon. If you travel around the world, you will see that there are several different methods being utilized to achieve these objectives, several of which are described in this text. After a uniform, high-moisture compost is produced via phase 1. Composting, the substrate must then be pasteurized and conditioned in a process known as phase 2. Composting. This too can be accomplished using a variety of methods, each with its own benefits. Before starting, a grower must decide what raw materials they will use to make the compost. The most common, and some say best, raw materials used for mushroom substrate production consist of wheat straw or wheat straw bedded horse manure, poultry manure, and gypsum. These materials are primarily used in Europe, North America, Australia, and South Africa, areas where a long history of button mushroom production exists. The basics for compost formulation are to utilize a carbohydrate source, wheat straw, mixed with a protein source, poultry manure, and gypsum, a necessary ingredient used worldwide. Though gypsum is an ingredient that must be included in the formula, the source of carbohydrate and protein varies globally as well as locally within the same country, depending on availability and costs. Not just any carbohydrate source can be utilized for button mushroom composting. The carbohydrate source should not consist of materials high in lignin, such as woody materials. Unlike white rot fungi that are able to efficiently degrade lignin, e.g. Pleurotus ostritus oyster mushroom, the button mushroom does not produce the necessary enzymes needed to break down this complex carbon. Rice straw is an alternative carbon source sometimes utilized in Asia to supplement or replace wheat straw. Though rice straw is quite different from wheat straw physically, it can be efficiently utilized to grow mushrooms if handled properly. In the eastern region of North America, mulch, grass-based hay, timothy, orchard, brome grass, etc., is often used in place of, or to supplement, wheat straw. Grass hays are tougher to compost and take longer to properly prepare, however, compost produced from these grasses can produce equally well as straw-based formulas. The same holds true for other carbon sources, often agricultural waste products. One alternative agricultural waste product currently being incorporated into commercial compost formulations is corn stover, the plant material left in the field after harvesting Z maize. Corn stover is much different in appearance than wheat straw. Typically, it may contain small pieces of the cob. The physical differences causing concern amongst many growers to incorporate this product into their formulas. However, the carbohydrate analyses of corn stover is quite similar to wheat straw and preliminary studies have found that it appears to produce as well as wheat straw when handled correctly. And is the case with any alternative raw material, growers should make changes slowly and check yields to ensure that any modifications to their formula or composting process have no negative impacts on yield or quality.
Since corn stover is physically larger, lower surface to volume ratio, initial work that we've done at the university has been studied utilizing a longer composting period to allow for adequate breakdown and ensuring adequate moisture holding capacity compared to a six day phase one composting period with wheat straw. Composters that are already composting for longer periods may not need to extend the length of composting, it will depend on existing materials and composting systems being utilized. Similarly, alternative nitrogen sources to poultry manure can be used based on availability of raw materials. Poultry manure is typically used because of the readily available supply and low costs. Vegetable meals, soybean and cottonseed, can be used to replace poultry manure as can ammonium sulfate and synthetic fertilizers. However, even if formulated for the same nitrogen content, varying nitrogen sources can impact the amount of ammonia produced during composting. Ammonia is beneficial in substrate preparation, and it can have significant impacts to conditioning during phase 2 composting. If applied at the wrong time, late phase 1, or if applied at too high a concentration, it may become very difficult to clear the ammonia during phase 2. In addition to deciding on which materials to utilize, growers have to determine the best method to mix the raw materials and incorporate water. The cheapest method is to turn piles with a pitchfork. However, this is very labor-intensive and, unless turned aggressively, is difficulty to produce uniform piles with high temperatures, often because of the lack of size of a pile turned by hand. This method is typically not used in countries that have large farms, however, there are small farms that currently still use this method in some countries. A better approach is to turn the pile, or windrow, using a mechanical loader, allowing for piles to be made larger and often reach higher temperatures. However, this method still does not allow for adequate mixing and the compost is typically not very uniform, making it more challenging to consistently produce high yields. A slightly more capital-intensive system is to turn the pile with a mechanical turner designed to mix compost. This system not only allows for large piles and thus higher temperatures, but it also helps produce uniformity in the compost, subsequently leading to much more consistent, higher yields. Mechanical turning is still frequently used in North America. Though turners are typically not used much anymore in Western Europe. The newest technology, and most advanced system, is to produce compost using a forced aerated system in a structure known as a Phase 1 bunker. Phase 1 bunkers minimize the chances of producing anaerobic compost by forcing air into the substrate, typically through a system of pipes built into the floor. These systems allow for more flexibility when adding water to the substrate and may reduce the time needed to compost. This flexibility and quality comes at a substantial cost for the engineering and building of these units. Phase 2 composting has two objectives, one, pasteurization to eliminate unwanted pests and competitor fungi as well as kill any mushroom and human pathogens and two, condition the compost, removal of free ammonia which is toxic to the mushroom mycelium. Phase 2 composting can be achieved in a growing room, whether cropping in trays or beds. The phase 1 substrate is filled into the beds or trays. Inside of the growing room and compost temperatures are raised to approximately 60 degrees Celsius by injecting steam into the room. Temperatures are then lowered to approximately 48 degrees Celsius to allow for conditioning to occur. Conditioning is the process in which beneficial microbes convert free ammonia to protein to be later used as a food source by the mushroom. The second method is to utilize a bulk phase 2 composting system in a specialized structure called a tunnel. A tunnel is similar to a bunker in that it provides aeration through floor to the compost, however, the air is recirculated to allow for uniform temperatures to be achieved in the headspace, air supply and compost. Fresh air entering a tunnel system is also filtered to prevent recontamination of the compost with pathogens and flies. Running phase 2 composting in the growing rooms requires an external energy source, boiler, to provide the steam and it also occupies growing space for up to two weeks until phase 2 composting is complete. The tunnel system allows for greater flexibility of moisture content of the compost and requires little energy to reach and maintain compost temperature set points. It also allows for more crops to be produced in a room per year due to the fact that the growing space is not occupied for the duration of the phase 2. However, the design and construction of a phase 2 tunnel, along with the necessary specialized equipment needed to fill and empty, can be a very expensive undertaking for a small farmer. 
If you ask a composter, a grower, or a consultant what the best formula and system is to make compost for mushroom production, you are sure to get different answers based on a person's experience and background. Many often feel that the only way to grow mushrooms is to do it right, meaning that modern phase 1 bunkers and phase 2 tunnels are needed and only wheat straw or wheat straw bedded horse manure based formulations should be utilized to reach optimum yields. Though they may be correct that aerated bunkers and wheat straw produce the highest yields, I don't necessarily always agree that it's the best option for everybody. It's possible that a grower doesn't need to pick 35 to 40 kg slash M2 to make a profit, depending on the scenario, a profit may be made at 20 kg per square meter, not to say that much. Higher yields can't be obtained on different raw materials, they can. Each operation and farm is different. Regarding labor availability, raw material costs, energy costs and the market for the mushrooms produced. Therefore the design of each farm should be based on the region and the marketplace. Growers do not always need to stick with what the other guy is doing, especially if the other guy is located hundreds or even thousands of kilometers away, just because that farm has years of experience and they are picking high yields. There are a multitude of potential raw materials available for mushroom growers to try in their compost formulation, some may work better than others, but we should not be close. Minded and accept that there is only one way to do things. Utilizing other materials may just require a different way of thinking and require making adjustments to what is considered standard composting. Procedures. Staying flexible and looking at alternative, more economic materials may be beneficial for smaller growers based on their profit margin and geographic location. Mushroom Cultivation Manual. For the Small Mushroom Entrepreneur. Ivanka Milinkovic. Kingdom Fungi. Mushroom cultivation seeks to recreate natural processes in controlled conditions. This applies to a high-tech approach as much as for a simple and small production. The better the growing chamber is able to simulate nature, the better the phi NAL result will be, the better the quality and quantity of the edible fruiting bodies, or mushrooms, will be. This is the secret of a successful production. But what does this term, successful production, Entail? Is it the ability to create fruiting bodies on some substrate under controlled conditions? Or is it rather the opportunity for a sustainable business generated by this product? Given their biological, physiological, and nutritive characteristics, it is not overly ambitious to expect that mushrooms, especially those from the Pleurotus oyster mushroom, Lentinus, SHI take, or Auricularia family can be grown on a variety of substrates made from cellulose containing material. Even this small step requires some skill, yet it is probable that mushrooms will grow. However, if these fruiting bodies are to be used as the basis of a small business, the producer needs to be knowledgeable of as well as provide and maintain favorable conditions. The purpose of this manual is to present information that is indispensable for producing cellulose utilizing mushrooms. Another goal is to provide instructions on how to establish a sustainable mushroom production based on available materials. To be frank, with some luck a producer will end up with mushrooms, regardless whether the substrate is of a poor quality or if the growing conditions he provides the fungi are near impossible. However, an acceptable yield of good quality which grants the grower with an income requires know-how and most importantly an understanding of the process. This manual will try to explain the processes of mushroom production in the simplest and most effective way, in a way that is easy to understand. It is envisioned for novices as well as for those already active in the business. The author's approach is straightforward, the producer has to understand the process. Each step should be clear and logical, the producer needs to know what is important and why. Specify seed details of the approach taken by each individual practitioner is less important, since different contexts will largely INFL influence these decisions, area available, raw materials available, location, desired production volume, etc. Regardless of these factors, the production process must provide clear results, which are in fact nothing more than fulfillment of the mushroom's biological needs. 
To conclude, it is not important how some phase slash need of production will be achieved, it is important to fulfill LL basic needs and to understand why they are important in the Phi RST. Place The Kingdom of Fungi Fungi include more than 4.000.000 different species found even in the most hostile and extreme conditions. They are able to survive extremely high or extremely low temperatures. It is little surprise that fungi can be found deep in ice on Earth's poles and immediately after wildfire residential or other catastrophes. In most cases, fungi survive due to their ability to form spores. What seeds are to plants is similar to what spores are to fungi, spores result from asexual reproduction and are protected from extreme conditions for extended periods of time. In natural ecosystems, fungi represent a high potential cleaning mechanism. They phi and, and degrade complex materials from their surroundings to use as their food. Unlike plants, fungi cannot capture carbon from the air and therefore, like animals, have to digest organic compounds such as carbohydrates, fats and proteins, they are heterotrophic. Unlike animals, fungi digest food by excreting enzymes outside their body and absorb food or digested organic compounds into their bodies through osmosis. They are osmotrophic. This feeding patterns requires a large surface area relative to body size, and thus the fungal body is an interconnected net-like mass of mycelium, made from thin thread-like tubular hyphae which branch and extend radially as they grow. It is difficult to know the exact age of fungi. As fossil records are scant, the oldest fossil discovered as of yet being only 400 million years old. Heckman et al., 2001, used DNA. Sequencing used to estimate that fungi phi RST appeared 1.5 billion years ago. They suggest fungi started to colonize land 1 billion years ago, probably in the form of lichens, compound. Organisms of symbiotic algae slash cyanobacteria and fungi, greatly contributing in changing atmospheric composition by increasing oxygen content. In comparison, plants appeared on land around 700 million years ago, and it is believed the very assisted by fungi to adapt to the new conditions, Pirozinski and Malik, 1975. Animals in turn did not become proper habitants of land until around 400 million years ago, Munich et al., 2010. Once on land, the evolution of higher fungi was a gradual process. Higher fungi are those that belong to Basidiomycota and Ascomycota phyla. Encyclopedia Britannica provides a good overview of this timeline. 500 million years ago, hyphae similar to modern Basidiomycota appear. 300 million years ago, fungi with characteristics similar to Ascomycota and Basidiomycota phi RST appear. 130 to 200 million years ago, fungi with easily recognizable mushroom fruiting bodies appear. The Assembling the Fungal Tree of Life project identify at 558 taxa in 430 genera, 68 orders and 5 e. Phyla, Lutsoni et al., 2004. However, the phi ELD of fungi classified cation is wide and due to contemporary molecular methods, novel findings and reorganizations are to be expected. And, as all mycologists will tell you, there are certainly many more fungi that have not been discovered than those that have. Mushroom producers are interested in those fungi species that can be seen with naked eye, known as macromycete or mushrooms. Systematically speaking, most of the species that are interesting for the cultivator, because they are edible and can be cultivated under artificial conditions, are in the class Agaricomycetes, order Agaricales. Although cultivated and edible mushrooms can differ morphologically, biological classified cation clearly points to common characteristics. Without considering cell morphology and sexual reproduction, which is the basis for the biological classify cation, we would like to emphasize that all species from the class agromycetes have the same life cycle. All mushroom species that are of interest for producers and gatherers go through two phases in their life cycle. 1. Mycelium growth, also known as vegetative phase, and 2. Fruit body formation, or the germinative phase. When conditions are right, fungal spores germinate into a single cell, which extends, multiplies and 
branches to make hyphae. A mass of hyphae interconnects into a web to make mycelium. This is the mushroom body and it will keep on developing as long as the conditions for vegetative phase remain favorable. From the perspective of mushroom production, spore fertility is the most important characteristic of the hyphae. Mycelium generated through spore germination can either be fertile, able to form a fruiting body, or sterile, unable to form a fruiting body. Spore fertility depends on the mushroom species or a biological mechanism called the recombination process that occurs during the moment of spore formation. Sterile mycelium is only able to form a fruiting body in case that it encounters another hyphae of a different sex type, wherein it become fertile. Only fertile mycelium has the necessary morphological characteristics that will enable effie scient and robust growth. In the vegetative phase, fungi colonizes its substrate through mycelium growth. In the moment of stress, it can be any large deviation from the optimal conditions, the mushroom will switch to an other developmental phase, from the vegetative phase to the germinative phase. The phi NAL result of this phase is the edible mushroom. The germinative phase has one important purpose and that is spore formation. When you look at the fruiting body, spores could be found on the lower side of the cap on phi any structures that are called lamellae or tubules. Spore formation is a very important phase during which genetic recombination is occurring in the fruiting body. This genetic mechanism has an effect on the fungi that will later develop from the spore. Special envelopes protect the spore, enabling its prevalence in unfavorable conditions. After all, fruit body formation is a response to the unfavorable conditions. Therefore, we can conclude that the formation of the fruiting body, that is the mushroom, is a response to non-optimal conditions. Wind, water and insects facilitate the spatial scattering of spores and enable the spreading of the mushroom realm. As nature commands, mushroom cultivation technology. Mushroom production is the only economically feasible biotechnology that converts complex organic molecules into more simple ones that can be used as food by humans. Fungi possess an aggressive enzyme complex, exogenous cellulolytic enzymes, with the capacity to degrade cellulose molecules in a fast and efficient way. A profi table production must provide those conditions that promote fungal enzymatic function. In effect, all that we want and need to do is to efficiently simulate the natural processes. Typical for cellulose degrading species from the order of agaricales. Our job is to eliminate all obstacles and provide those conditions that will enable the fungi to complete its life cycle. Cultivation technology can be divided in three segments, each of them equally important and indispensable. 1. Spawn production. 2. Substrate preparation. 3. Fruit body production. Spawn is comparable to a stem cutting of a higher plant. Similarly, spawn vegetatively propagates fungi of the same genetic material. From a genetics perspective, macromycetes are unpredictable and unstable organisms. The genetics and breeding of these fungi, as well as subsequent preparation of spawn for commercial purposes, is a very sensitive and delicate process. Laboratories with specialized equipment tackle this issue through molecular genetic methods, selecting strains to meet the needs of commercial producers. This is the origin of strains used in commercial cultivation. Once created, a strain is the protected property of its author. It is guarded in hibernation under strict laboratory conditions, necessary in order to keep the genetic stability of the strain. Commercially, a strain's mycelium is cultivated on sterile grains to create spawn. However, innovative approaches have enabled the use of artificial substrates as a growing medium for the mycelium of macromycetes. At the beginning of spawn production, the mycelium culture needs to be revitalized from hibernation. The mycelium is then multiplied on liquid or solid media in the laboratory. Mycelium of a good quality is then transferred onto sterile grains, typically rye, sakali cereal, millet, panicum miliaceum, or sometimes wheat, triticum durum, and then grown, under stable conditions free from microorganisms, until the mycelium envelopes each grain. Each grain then becomes a potential inoculation point. When it is applied to the substrate, attempting to produce mycelium on your own will most probably yield some result. Macromycetes. Mycelium can be propagated vegetatively from parts of the fruiting body, 
bought in a store for example. Because of their biological and physiological characteristics. Another option is to multiply the spawn. Bought from commercial producer on grains. However, amateur spawn resulting from these activities is extremely risky and often has damaging consequences for production. Beside that, there is the issue of the right to propagate biological material. That is the intellectual property of its authors without their permission. Even when the culture is derived directly from a wild mushroom variety, the problems with amateur mycelium production are serious and place the success of the whole production into question. The preservation of genetic stability is critical, vitality, growth ability and growth speed, robust. Ness and non-ideal nutritive conditions are all important characteristics. As mentioned before, macromycetes genetics are unpredictable and unstable. Repetitive multiplying by non-professionals generally leads to loss of all these important characteristics and leads to blunders and losses in production. These details are important background information but also lead to the conclusion that in-house spawn production is not recommended for small mushroom entrepreneurs, regardless of experience. In addition, it should be noted that the pure culture of a selected macromycete is difficult to obtain. As a result of our experience as both producers and in mushroom projects around the world, we strongly recommend mycelium produced by Sylvan Incorporated, the world leader in this industry. Substrate as we have seen, all cultivated species are closely related. However, as in life, some family members are more hardworking and capable than others. In the mushroom world, this means being able to prepare their own food from complex cellulose molecules that are the main building blocks of plants. The hard workers include shiitake, oyster mushrooms, poplar mushrooms. They can be grouped under the name of cellulose degrading mushrooms or white rot fungi. On the other hand, there are family members not able to prepare their own food, the white button mushroom, commonly called champignon, caprinus, shaggy cap, etc. The main difference between these two groups is their physiology and the differing way that they digest their food. During the vegetative growth phase, during which a fungi's mycelium is expanding, the white button mushroom feeds off of the so-called lignohumus complex. During this phase, the quantity of a simple Sugars present in the compost remains almost unchanged. However, during the germination phase, these simple sugars are degraded to power the formation of the fruiting body. To generate degradation, the mushroom secretes an arsenal of exoenzymes, i.e. enzymes, outside of the fungal body. Some scientists believe that the mechanism behind the absorption of degraded molecules from compost is unique in the mushroom world. It is very interesting to note that the white button mushroom has been Shown to grow up to two times slower in sterile substrate, clearly, the mushroom has forged a special relationship with specified seed microorganisms present in the compost. White button mushrooms fulfill LL all their nutritive requirements from the growing medium, known as substrate or compost, which is prepared in a process called composting. It is important to note that mushroom compost cannot be made from composting any organic material, that is, material of plant origin. Furthermore, the mushroom composting process differs significantly from the composting process that turns organic materials into compost for use in the cultivation of plants. Straw and chicken slash horse manure are the raw materials most often used for preparation of compost. For white button mushroom production, the process can be successfully realized in specify C conditions and with specify C hardware, and presently, with the help of automation slash software. Compost for the white button mushroom, and those similar to it, is a complex system slash environment. With specify C physical, chemical and biological characteristics, which together create the conditions needed for the mushroom to complete its life cycle. One of the most important characteristics of compost is its high selectivity. This means that its conditions favor a narrow range of organisms, one of which is the white button mushroom. Beside the inherent biological complexity of Cultivating the white button mushroom, their high vulnerability contributes to the trend of intensifying cultivation. Industrial production is characterized by high efficacy, fast cycles, and high yield. In order to achieve these results, dedicated R&D addresses all aspects of production, from technology to breeding and genetics. White button mushroom strains developed for these production systems are 
very demanding, or we can say spoiled, regarding their growing conditions. As a consequence, small scale producers with the ambition to supply the local market best look past the production of white button mushrooms. Luckily, there is a second group of hardworking mushrooms with signified camp physiological differences. The cellulose degrading or white rot fungi. The oyster mushroom belongs to this group and in nature grows on the residues of dead higher plants. Their vegetative growth is driven exclusively by their own enzyme complex, given suffiscient moisture in the material, enzymes degrade, complex, lignocellulose molecules into simpler molecules that the mushroom can make use of. The fructified cation phase does not have specified C nutritive requirements. These characteristics are exploited for production processes of white rot fungi species. In a controlled environment such as that of a growing chamber, the oyster mushroom requires these dairy elements, cellulose, containing material, to provide energy, and suffiscient moisture content of the material to enable enzymatic activity. Another important point that requires attention of the producer is eliminating the enemies of the oyster mushroom. In most cases, these are other fungi that feed off of similar components like the oyster mushroom. They are biologically more robust and resistant and easily outcompete cultivated mushrooms. How to choose raw materials? White rot fungi are cultivated on cellulose containing materials. The lignocellulose complex, which contains cellulose, is a structural material. Materials rich in lignocellulose include woody plants, from which sawdust, wood chips, or even logs are used for mushroom production. Grains, from which straw is used for mushroom production. Other plants with solid stem, from which hard stem pieces, branches, etc., are used for mushroom production. And husks from coffee beans as well as brewery spent grain, coffee waste, coffee are used for mushroom production. People often ask if they can use greenish plants or greenish parts of plants, for example, leaves, for mushroom production. The answer is no. A short reminder, oyster mushroom and other white rot fungi grow exclusively on the lignocellulose complex. The greenish part of plants, those which would stain your hand green upon being squeezed, cannot be a raw material for the production of substrate since they do not contain the lignocellulose complex. The Phi RST criterion to identify a suitable material for mushroom substrate is the amount of cellulose it contains. The material needs to be available to the producer, located nearby, and there must be a way to transport it. Simply put, sustainable production of oyster mushroom and cellulose degrading species can only be achieved if suitable cellulosic material is available up to 30 kilometers away from the production site. The reason for this is simple raw materials for mushroom substrate are lightweight and bulky, and long distance transportation is not economically justified addition. Thus, the choice of raw material for substrate is dictated by its availability and how easy it is for the producer to collect it. The second criterion, no less important, is its cleanliness. This term as it is used here means that the material should be free from dust, dirt and other impurities that do not contain cellulose, examples. Include an orange peel in coffee waste, green leaves among branches, cellophane amongst straw. The term also refers to Lack of microorganisms like molds that can be seen with the naked eye. And that the material was not intensively treated with chemicals during its production or handling. The presence of molds can be easily observed, but the situation is quite different for the presence of chemicals or a high heavy metal content. Some protective agents used in contemporary plant production have the effect of preventing fungal growth on their byproducts after harvest. In these cases, it is possible for the fungi to successfully grow on a contaminated substrate, but the chances of absorbing pesticide residues along with its food is high. In the end, such negatively enriched mushrooms will end up on our plates. The only way to address these issues is to develop a relationship with the supplier or to fight ND. Out how the material was produced or handled. In the urban context, mushroom production on coffee waste is very popular and attractive. Given the variation of type and quantity of coffee consumed across cultures and possible challenge to efficiency of collection, this material can be complemented by or replaced with brewery spent. Grain from the local mini-breweries, good quality. Cardboard without plastic, 
phi any cut branches from parks, etc. In rural or periurban areas where straw, sawdust, or corn cobs are available, these materials should be prioritized since mushroom production with them is more secure and easy to handle. The substrate preparation process. Substrate preparation for the oyster mushroom and similar species needs to fulfill LL several conditions. Competitors that use the same food source as our mushroom must be eliminated. Access to cellulose in the selected material. And suffy scient moisture in the material slash substrate. Based on experimental knowledge, long-term experience, and understanding of the biology and physiology of white rot fungi, the above-listed goals can be achieved with a large variety of processes in different conditions and circumstances. Common sterilization and pasteurization processes will not be emphasized as the basic, primary, and only possible ones. Elimination of potential competitors. Most problems that occur during the production of mushroom substrate relate to this aspect. Producers design their processes to achieve pasteurization or even sterilization of the material designated for substrate. Of course, there is no doubt that these approaches can contribute to a successful production. However, both of these processes intensively consume energy and thus entail a high cost. Also, the effects of these treatments on other key production parameters has to be taken into account. For example, pasteurization with steam dries out the material. Finally, substrate after it is subjugated to pasteurization slash sterilization will most likely be exposed to open air at some point, after which the intent behind these expensive processes is lost. The recommended approach to eliminate potential competitors is to expose the material to ample and intensive washing using clean water and letting it FL out through the material. The water used for this process can be reused for other activities on the farm or in the household, but it cannot be reused more than once. For substrate washing, the water will contain impurities that were washed from the material. The water can, however, still be used to maintain the level of moisture in the air in the cultivation chambers. Washing can take anywhere from 1 to 24 hours, depending on the type of material and quantity involved. Simply put, one can tell the process is finished when water coming out from the material is clean. Ensuring cellulose availability and suffy scient moisture in the substrate. The most important part of the substrate preparation phase is to provide easily accessible food that is cellulose for fungal mycelia. This entails loosening and or breaking bonds between cellulose and other parts of the lignocellulose molecule. The material has to be fragmented. Fracturing, splintering, and or cutting the substrate's raw material damages the protective layer whose purpose in nature is to protect plants by repelling water. On the molecular level, the lignocellulose structure is cracked. Clearly, materials such as sawdust or coffee waste do not have to be fragmented, all other materials have to be cut into particles that are 2 to 5 centimeters long and wide. After being cut up and washed, the material is then immersed in water, which should submerge it completely. Prolonged soaking leads to relaxing slash loosening of the links between cellulose and lignin. Even for the hardest cellulose-containing material. The result is that cellulose in the substrate is more available for mushroom mycelium. Soaking length depends on the type of raw material, table 2. Providing conditions for the successful activity of fungal enzymes. Cellulose-degrading mushrooms secrete enzymes outside of their mycelium and into their immediate environment, where the enzymatic activity occurs. The efficiency of this activity enables rapid growth of mycelium through the substrate, simply because it is able to provide plenty of food for itself. It is important that the fungi has a strong start after the substrate has been inoculated for it to compete with microorganisms that feed on the same food. The main condition to encourage this is to have suffy scient moisture in the substrate. The water has to be absorbed by the substrate, as the substrate cannot be submerged during production. Why? Excess of water means a shortage of oxygen, and without oxygen, there is no growth or survival of mycelium. We can conclude that we need to maximize the amount of water absorbed by the substrate. How do we achieve this? There are many technical solutions available, the producer needs to choose the one that suits his conditions the best. One thing should always be kept in mind, the most adequate approach is the one 
with which the final product will have a competitive price on the market. Only in this way will production will be sustainable. 1. Cutting Procedure In the case of coffee waste, coffee husk, spent brewery grain or sawdust, cutting can be skipped. However, in the case that material with larger particle is used including straw, branches, cardboard, etc., the material has to be cut into pieces from 2 to 5 cm length. The easiest way to do this is to use a hammer mill, typically available in an agricultural setting, but other solutions can be found that are more appropriate to specific conditions of the producer. No matter which process you choose, the outcome has to be the same, fragmented material. 2. Washing Procedure All raw materials, straw, corn cobs, sawdust, wood chips, cardboard, etc., except coffee waste has to be exposed to a large quantity of running clean water. The washing lasts until the water coming out of the material is clean. If the material was stored and transported under conditions of low hygiene, for example, parks near the streets, bulk corn cobs and trailers, longer washing is necessary. Similarly, in these cases, the producer will see clean water leaving the material when it is clean. There is one specific situation that requires washing even when the material is clean, the use of brewery spent grain. This material is very clean, even sterile, yet has a high content of simple sugars and proteins. The oyster mushroom and other white rot fungi do not use them. On the other hand, these molecules are a great source of food for other species that compete with the oyster mushroom or can cause it harm. In order to eliminate this threat, brewery spent grain must be exposed to running water for an extended period and then left submerged to soak for 24 hours. During the soaking period, the water needs to be changed from time to time as it will become saturated with proteins and sugars from the material. Even after intensive washing, it is recommended to mix brewery spent grain with some other material less rich in sugars and proteins in order to make the substrate less attractive for the growth of competitor fungi. Coffee waste does not need washing if it is used recently after it has been collected. However, Use of this material does require well-tuned logistics, including an agreement with the coffee waste supplier to use clean collecting containers. We recommend that a mushroom producer provides the clean dishes and delivers them in return for one full of coffee waste. In addition, collected coffee waste needs to be used for mushroom production in a period no longer than four days since it was used for brewing. It must be underlined, washing raw materials for substrate is the most important step in the mushroom production process. 3. Adoption of Adequate Amount of Water Celluloids containing weeds, 24 hours Straws, 36 hours Sawdust from deciduous trees, 96 hours Table 2. Soaking time for various materials to prepare substrate If the material is to be soaked for more than 24 hours, water needs to move around from time to time. This can be achieved with a simple submersible pump or just by change of water. This procedure has to ensure that the availability of oxygen is refreshed to prevent anaerobic processes from occurring. The water can be heated, but that depends on the conditions in which the producer operates and her slash his possibilities. It is generally recommended to heat up the material during the soaking phase. However, it must be noted that the temperature of the water should not exceed 55 degrees Celsius. The reason for this limit has been repeated several times in this text and must always stay prominent in the mind of the producer, financial feasibility. Heated water is better absorbed by the material. Thus, its lignocellulose bonds are loosened more efficiently, resulting in a shorter substrate preparation process. However, heating water does not achieve pasteurization. That is a completely different approach. The goal of the mushroom producer that is in tune with biological rhythms of the process is to provide food for the white rot fungi, not to kill the microorganisms present on the food source. Even if you would like to do this, it is very difficult to achieve in a small-scale production. After soaking, excess water has to be eliminated from the substrate because it diminishes oxygen availability, which is crucial for the growth of mycelium. If the producer decides to use coffee waste, special attention has to be paid to the amount of moisture. S slash he must ensure that this material did not lose the moisture that it acquired during the brewing of coffee. If indeed the material is too dry, then it has to be carefully soaked using fine filter bags. We will remind the reader that a crucial goal of substrate preparation is to provide adequate moisture in the 
substrate, which is absolutely necessary for the function of cellulose-degrading enzymes that provide the fungi its food. 4. Inoculation. Hygiene is the basic and most important condition that has to be fulfilled during inoculation. It is also important to check if the substrate is cold, the substrate's temperature must not exceed 20 degrees Celsius during inoculation. This process must be conducted in a clean space, sheltered from the wind and from insects. Spawn bought from specialized producers has to be broken into small pieces with clean hands. The next step is to mix spawn with the substrate, 2.1 kg of spawn, 3L, to 100 kg of substrate. It should be noted that spawn is typically measured by its volume, L. Spawn needs to be mixed into the substrate slowly and evenly, by hand or some other convenient tool. A uniform spread will ensure that mycelial growth from the inoculation points will interconnect as fast as possible into a single organism, leaving little resources for competitors to grow. No matter which material is used to prepare the substrate, the mushroom producer must pay attention to its pH. Optimal pH is between neutral to slightly alkaline, a range more suitable for cellulose-degrading mushrooms than for competitors. We recommend the addition of about 0.5% CaCO3 in tiny grumps. During the step of substrate and mycelium mixing, the substrate is then packed into the polyethylene, plastic, bags. They must not be biodegradable because the mushroom will degrade them during its growth. The bag's dimensions are not a critical issue for production, but the general recommendation is 60 to 70 centimeters high and about 40 centimeters width. It is important to Note that small bags holding 1 to 2 kilograms of substrate are not recommended for production, except in the case that inoculation is only for fun. Substrate in bags that have a smaller volume easily loses moisture and this complicates fructification. The thickness of the bags is more important, it should allow the substrate to be firmly packed into it without ripping. Before the bags are packed, they need to be perforated. The cutting should be made in the shape of cross, with the dimensions 2 by 2 centimeters. The distance between the perforations should be about 25 centimeters. Mushroom cultivation. As was already mentioned, mushroom cultivation is the simulation of natural processes in a controlled environment. The greater the degree of quality with which natural conditions are replicated in the growing chambers, the better the result that can be expected. In order to understand the cultivation process and the parameters involved, the producer should Think about the natural environment in which edible, medicinal and all other kinds of mushrooms can be found. First of all, they cannot be found in places where water runs or lies in puddles. Mushrooms inhabit humid places, away from direct sunlight. The same principles must be applied in the production chamber, one must not focus on high humidity or produce puddles in growing unit. Secondly, mushrooms cannot be found in places where air currents can be felt or are intense. Similarly, artificial conditions must avoid intense or uncontrolled flowing of air. Thirdly, when is it that we find ending mushrooms in nature? It is always after a sudden change in the environment, like that following rain or a storm, when the air is refreshed. These conditions have to be replicated in cultivation chambers to ensure that mushrooms mark undisturbed and good growth. Fourthly, mushrooms that are convenient for cultivation do not inhabit extremely hot or extremely cold places. This means that the temperature in the growing unit should be between 15 and 25 degrees Celsius. Ventilation system. The following conditions need to be provided in all cases, regardless of whether we are referring to a micro, small or high-tech production. The process is in essence the same in all these cases. The growing chamber must have no more than one fan. The capacity of the fan should be 10 exchanges of the total volume of air in the chamber per hour. If the room, for example, has an area of 25 m2 and is 3 m high, volume of 75 cubic meters, the fan's capacity should be able to exchange 750 cubic meters of air per hour. The fan is placed within a mixing box whose bottom is movable, it can be lifted up and down. There is a vertical duct coming out from the bottom of the box. The end of duct away from the mixing box has no closing on its end, opening to the growing chamber and located near the floor. At the same time, the mixing box is located up against the wall of the growing unit with an opening to allow the fan to freely draw in air from outside. The bottom of the mixing box has a damper, which when lifted allows the fan to pull in air from the bottom of growing unit, i.e. above. 
the ground, into the mixing box. On. The other hand, when the damper is. Closed, the fan will draw in only the. Outside air into the mixing box with. Its full capacity. The mixing box may. Be improvised or constructed in a. Sophisticated manner, however the. Main structural design that enables its. Basic function has to be maintained. The figure below shows a mixing box. Heating or cooling air for the growing unit is achieved by using heat exchangers installed in the mixing box. It is not allowed to use air conditioning units. Why? As has already been stated, moderate airflow is a must for successful mushroom production. Another fan will increase the speed of airflow and result in no mushrooms. The fan should be set up to blow air into a polyethylene tube whose diameter is equal to the fan's diameter, placed across the ceiling of the growing unit. The tube should be perforated with the holes. In two rows, positioned like clock hands pointing to half past one and half past ten if one is facing the opening of the tube. The end of the tube should reach the other end of the growing chamber and be tied in a knot, forcing all air to flow through the holes. In this way, we assure even airflow in the chamber and guarantee that each cutting on the bag of substrates receives an equal amount of good quality air. Air humidity. Humidifying a growing unit can be achieved simply by pouring water on the floor. Using sprinklers or nozzles for this purpose is not recommended. However, the need for additional air humidity may arise. As during hot periods when cooling is necessary, remember how much water is drained from air-conditioned rooms in the summer. This can be addressed by a so-called water curtain. In other words, air that enters the growing chamber is forced to pass through a curtain of pouring water or a wet barrier, thus absorbing moisture as it enters the growing chamber. At the same time, the water curtain lowers the temperature of the incoming air, achieving a double effect of humidification and cooling on hot days. Organization of space. Besides providing microclimatic conditions, the organization of space is vital. The positioning of racks and shelves has to be carefully planned. Cellulose degrading mushrooms do not require shelves, which can entail high expenses. Instead, hooks and racks can be used. It is important to always have in mind that mushroom cultivation is nothing more than the simulation of natural processes. Rapid airflow should be avoided. And thus the amount of substrate in growing unit must be optimized. One cubic meter of space must not contain more than 20 kilograms of substrate. How the substrate is arranged is not important. The cultivation process. Mushroom cultivation begins at the moment of substrate inoculation with spawn and can be split into two phases. Incubation phase. The incubation period is when all the small pieces of vegetative mushroom body scattered in the substrate of spawn during inoculation continue to grow in order to interconnect with each other. At the same time, surely other microorganisms like molds are also present in the same substrate and grow as well. Some of the microorganisms do not harm our mushroom while others compete with it for food and space. In order to encourage efficient growth of our mushroom's mycelium and to give it an advantage over competitors, key parameters are addressed and optimized during the substrate preparation step. However, once in the cultivation chambers, additional steps must be taken during the incubation period. To support the mushroom. Firstly, temperature in the chamber must be maintained between 20 to 22 degrees Celsius. The inflow of fresh air is completely eliminated by closing the damper regulating inflow of fresh air from outside the cultivation chamber. The floor needs to occasionally be covered in water to maintain air moisture. In such conditions, mycelium will grow rapidly and after three weeks, the whole substrate will be covered by mycelium. The smell in the growing unit should be pleasant, of mushrooms and forest litter. And certainly not of dankness or mold. Smell is the best indicator of a good situation in growing. Chamber, and is the phi RST to signal that something has gone wrong. Fructify cation phase. After about three weeks, around each cross-shaped hole, cut into the bag, there will be a thickening. Of mycelium, tracing the shape of the hole. This is the moment for a dramatic change in microclimatic conditions in the growing unit to simulate a storm. In effect we mimic conditions after the rain, INFLO of fresh air. This means that the fan should work at full tilt. 
With these changes, a switch is stimulated in the mycelium from a vegetative growth phase to a phase in which fructified cation bodies are formed. In the initial moments of fruit body formation, temperature in the growing chamber should be decreased to between 16 to 18 degrees Celsius. The fan should work constantly and the damper should be open so that 70% of air comes from the outside the growing chamber and 30% is drawn from the growing unit. The FL ore should be periodically dampened. It is important for the mushroom producer to simulate day and night for cellulose degrading mushrooms. Artificial lights, specify Cali, which kind is not critical, should be switched on and off routinely. Three to four days after fructify cation was initiated, mushrooms will start to appear in bunches from the holes in the bags. Mushrooms grow from substrate in so called waves or FL ashes. During the phi RST wave it can be expected that every cutting on the substrate bag is decorated with a bouquet of oyster mushroom. Bunches should be carefully picked from the bag at the moment when the oyster mushroom's cap starts to bend up. The size of the fruiting body does not indicate maturity of the mushroom, its shape does. The right moment for harvest. The spot from which the bunch was removed needs to be cleaned from remaining fragments of mycelium and be airy and ready for the next FL ush. The conditions at the beginning of fructified cation need to be maintained during whole period. It is desirable that after the phi RST wave is over, to cut off INFLO of fresh air and turn off the light for two to three days. Opinions are divided on this practice, but it might be that it intensify ES the second wave. The second FL ush will come after seven days and lasts for five days. The whole fructified cation period should result in a yield of about 18 kilograms of fresh oyster mushrooms per 100 kilograms of inoculated substrate. This proportion, 18%, is estimated for conditions prevalent in intensive small-scale production, where one cycle takes about seven weeks. It is important to note that conditions in real production and the laboratory are not the same. Theoretical yield can be much higher but the length of growing cycles and repeatability of results should be taken into account. A small mushroom Business should not be planned on the basis of high expectations, but on realistic and objective ones. Preparation of Growing Unit Slash Hygiene Before dwelling into this subject, it is important to remind the reader that the approach to mushroom production presented in this handbook is rooted in the physiology and biology of cellulose degrading mushrooms and in a preference to optimize conditions that favor mycelium growth rather than trying to eliminate competitors. In this way, the mushroom has an edge to win in its phi GHT against competitors. Without problems. With this in mind, we can see that hygiene of the level present in sterile spaces of hospitals and surgery rooms are difficult to be replicated in a small mushroom business. Moreover, it is very expensive to do so. The question also remains, is it really necessary? The spaces used during the production process include those where substrate is prepared, substrate is inoculated, the growing chambers, and the space where harvested mushrooms are stored and packed. Simply put, all these spaces must at all times be clean and neat. The space is which substrate is prepared needs to be washed after the step is completed, making sure to remove all fragments of substrate. All containers and accessories that were used have to be cleaned. After washing, these materials should be dried and put back into a space designated for their keeping. The space for inoculation must also be cleaned every time after the step has been completed. The producer must take care that little bits of mycelium do not remain hidden out of sight. Before the next inoculation step starts, the working surface should be disinfected, for example, with 96% alcohol. Of course, household products for disinfection are also acceptable. If the working space for substrate preparation, as well as for the inoculation, is too large and it proves difficult to maintain as in a household, then the best alternative is to use copper sulfate, i.e. CuSO4. Of course, this substance is used in addition to intense cleaning of the workspace before its application. Instructions provided on the package for its use should be followed. Hygiene of a growing unit. The growing unit, which houses the inoculated substrate, must be as clean as a kitchen. At 
the end of the previous production cycle after. The bags of spent substrate have been ejected. The growing chamber must be carefully cleaned. Of all fragments and sediment, large and small. This includes all that can be seen with the naked eye and remains from the recently completed production cycle. After this, the chamber is to be washed. For this purpose, it is important that the growing unit was initially located where this is possible. Washing is conducted only with water from a municipal water supply or another source which provides clean slash filtered water. Clean growing units must be occasionally paint. Ed before new substrate can be put in. Painting is needed only when dark spots can be seen in the corners of the chamber implicating the emergence of molds. Regardless whether a chamber is painted or not, after cleaning it is necessary to heat the chamber to 18 degrees Celsius for the 24 hours and then apply a mild copper sulfate treatment. This is a classical approach in the battle against molds and it is best to follow instructions available on the packaging. During cultivation, the growing unit should also be treated like a clean kitchen, do not leave waste. Do not enter with dirty footwear and maintain everything clean and tidy. We must not forget that we are producing food and doing so by emulating nature. With the knowledge that nature does not have anything sterilized, similarly, we can conclude that we also do not need sterile conditions. Problems in the production, in situ. There are always problems that arise during production, and there always will be. Cultivation of oyster mushroom is specify C in the way that few remedies exist once the substrate has been inoculated. Therefore, the small mushroom entrepreneur should be aware of the most common problems they will face, provided in the following list. It is also important to understand the problem and its cause to avoid wrong remedies, which unfortunately often make a situation worse than it is. 1. Poor mycelium growth emanating from spawn, in the substrate bag. Mycelium starts to grow from spawn fragments and suddenly stops. The substrate does not change color or show signs of contamination. The cause, poor chemical composition of raw materials, full of pesticides and or additives. Mycelium fails to grow from the spawn and it turns green in color. The cause, old slash poor quality spawn, spawn was not properly stored, moisture is too high. In the substrate or spawn was inoculated while substrate temperature was above 30 degrees Celsius. Sporadic growth, wherein mycelium grows well from some spawn fragments and not at all from other fragments. The cause, unequal substrate quality, often due to unequal moisture content but also possibly due to raw materials used for the substrate. Pay attention to equally mix spawn equally when inoculating substrate. If the substrate begins to change color before it is incubated in the growing unit, this implies heavy presence of pathogens or competitors. It is likely a problem with the quality of raw materials used for the substrate. This is a good occasion to accentuate that if mycelium has already covered the substrate up to 50%, as visible from the outside of the bag, it does not have to be ejected from the growing unit. Our mushroom is a strong fighter and it is likely to best its competition at this point. However, the substrate bag must should not be open to avoid the spreading of competitor slash pathogen spores. 2. Poor fructification. Long stem of fruiting bodies, from slightly elongated to a fruiting body characterized by a long stem and a small cap, yet with no change in color. The cause, insufficient air in the growing unit at the moment of primordia formation, i.e. when a white ring of mycelium forms around the cuts in the bag. Elongation of the stem of the fruiting body with a change in the color. The cause, unsuccessful emulation of day-slash-night rhythm or insufficient lighting, often due to insufficient duration of lighting. Cauliflower shapes of mycelium on the cross-shaped cuts in the substrate bag. The cause, besides the possibility that the spawn carries a low genetic potential, most likely a lack of moisture in the substrate. It is possible to partly address this issue by pulling back the bag from the substrate and moistening with a gentle shower. However, this can only be done if there is no trace of other fungi slash molds, e.g. trichoderma species, penicillium species, etc., and the mycelium has mostly covered the substrate. The showering should be conducted very carefully to avoid damaging the mycelium and to avoid adding too much moisture. Fungi are neither aquatic organisms nor frogs. Conclusion Mushrooms are the product of an organism that is very much alive. 
An organism, which like all life, has its own biological needs. Along its life cycle that must be met for it to yield a healthy and beautiful bouquet of mushrooms at its natural crowning glory. 4. This, the mushroom cultivator must develop a profound familiarity with his fungi. Problems will arise, as they do for all growers, doubtlessly, knowledge will prove the most effective remedy. In this book, we provide the fundamentals of mushroom cultivation in the form of a manual, based off of years of experience in various contexts, from highly automatized almost laboratory conditions to simple store-roofed production in tropical mountains, and everything in between. However, like a spore awaiting the right conditions, this inoculated knowledge has to come to life through practice. We guarantee one thing, success does not come without many failures. For the mushroom cultivator that wants to take this art to the next level, to become a small mushroom entrepreneur, he must balance costs of his operations, including his own time, with revenues from mushroom yields. He must design his sustainable business to survive and thrive in the untamed reality of running a private business. This was the first two chapters.